Hello everyone and welcome to Horrific Chats. In this segment we speak to creators to discuss their aspirations, inspirations and journey into horror. Tonight we're joined by Justine Johnson Hammerstead, uh, one of uh, authors that have contributed to the show. Uh, great to have you on tonight Justine, how are you? Thank you so much, it's so nice to be here. Um, great to have you. Um, we were just talking before we went live there. Um, you were you were with us like right from the very beginning. We've we've just had our two year anniversary, um, and we kind of popped out of nowhere. And you're one of the authors who graciously decided to get involved with us. And uh, it can be kind of ropey, somebody just popping out of nowhere and going here. Then is your stuff, and we'll <laughs> do things with it. And promise not to butcher your works, honest gov. You know, and that's that initial when you don't have much to show for what you're trying to do and for someone to actually trust you with their work is a great thing and something we're always appreciative of in this show and any chance we can get them to promote you or let people uh talk to you see see what you're about uh see behind the curtain so to speak uh, it's always great um but when was that we were only um we were in a couple of months in i think of starting this show yeah yeah, yeah I your like story that. uh the staircase yes Yes, it was called the staircase, and I liked your I liked the whole ambiance of your publication. How it had the, the just, just a spooky vibe, and I like I like that. That's why I submitted. Oh, thanks. Um, we're of the attitude. Let's have a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you know, in the entertainment space, especially today, there are too many bloody people that take themselves far too seriously. Um. And horror sometimes can fall into that trap where people's trying to be spooky McSpooky Dark Lord, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and they forget that you can have a sense of humor too and enjoy this franchise. In fact, there's a whole genre of horror comedy yeah. that caters to it. Um, and there's also this, I don't know what it is, but especially in the writer's space, there's some like really bitter, twisted individuals. <laughs> that just can't see somebody else exist as if it's a major affront to them. I always, I always like the challenges because um, while these people are funny to watch, it can put, if somebody's coming into writing for the first time, uh, trying to maybe put themselves out there, that's a daunting prospect on its own. But if you encounter one of these type of people who are ready to shoot you down at the first opportunity, yeah, it, it can just stop you in your tracks. Yeah. So what I like to talk about in this show is basically how do, how do people overcome that? Not, we're all not unique. We've all been through it in some uh, shape or form, and we're still here, and we survived it. So don't ever let it stop your dreams. Don't let it stop you trying. That's kind of the whole focus of these chats in the show. Um, but you've been a writer for uh, quite a while now. Uh, what was the first major start? What When did you decide, I want to give this a go? This is what I want to do. Um, I was in a big car accident and uh when i just got married and so it was kind of a process to heal from that it was what my rehabilitation was and um to write and i went to school too i went to college too mm -hmm. so both of those things put together just helped me to focus and help me to learn and help me to recover and so that's what that's why i got into it was it just a tool was it just a write a journal or write a thought was it was it really yeah. that basic yeah it, it kind of started out that way but it went really fast in the stories it just i i don't i don't really know why it went that way it just it just did and it was just really really i could feel myself getting better all the time so i just i kept writing so were you a creative person before this or was this did it just open up something inside you i think it opened up something inside me and then so even though not the best of circumstances um, yeah but at the, at the same time as i was recovering i had seven kids so because i had just gotten married so i was having seven kids and for the staircase when i wrote that story my one of my kids was probably about six years old and she had drawn me a, a picture because she wanted to decorate for halloween mm -hmm. and um so she drew me this spooky picture and i thought oh that's good so I started to write a story about it and she could see that I was writing a story about it. So then she kept coming back with more pictures, kind of telling the whole story in pictures. So then I would write what she was showing me in her pictures. So 
that's where the staircase came from. It's really my daughter's pictures, just Brilliant. put in the words. And that kind of that kind of process, that kind of creative process of just kind of thinking outside the box where you, you don't really follow any set formula or anything. I think that's what helped me recover. Fantastic. Um, do you think people get too caught up in formula? I know formula is useful. It's good to have something to, to fall back on. It's good to have a good grounding or a foundation. But do you think people get too wrapped up in I must follow these beats or I'm not a writer or I'm not a creator. Uh, do you think that maybe might hold people back or is this something, did you maybe start off without a formula and then develop one or learn later on? You said you went to, yeah. you went to college for this. Um, yeah. Well, I, I had to, what was that experience well, like? What I went to college for, I went to, I studied English literature. So mm. not, not specifically writing, but English literature because I wanted to learn from the greats. I wanted to learn from like Edgar Allan Poe and Emily Bronte and those people. I wanted to see what, if I could see behind what made them right. God, I got and, um, the and Cleopatra from A levels, and I just I just bashed my head off the desk. Going, <laughs> I don't want to read anymore. This is boring. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but I was only a kid then, so. <laughs> um. What was your question? Um, so you started off with, uh, I was just talking about how people get wrapped up about needing yeah. a formula or thinking that yes. constrains them. You've kind of okay. done both. You started off not following the formula and then you decided to study and learn the formulas. How was that journey and how did it yeah. change you and your <clears throat> perception of, of that yeah. and, in terms of writing? The the people, the, the greats were really inspiring and you, could, you don't, didn't really... They didn't really follow a formula, I don't think, but they were just inspiring to how deep they saw into things. And, and I wanted to see that deep into things too. And um, I think it I think it was purposeful to break out of a formula because you don't want to be held by any restraints and you don't want to people even now, even though I've just released my third book, there was somebody who told me, Well, it didn't go this way, and this is the way it should have gone. And it uh, that's not what I wrote. That's not what I wanted to write. I wanted to. Did they enjoy the story, or did they not? And this is what I'm talking about. The and this is what can be off-putting if somebody's wanting to create for the first time. If somebody mm -hmm. says they enjoyed your story, cool. Or if somebody says they didn't enjoy your story, and here's why: I didn't like this character, or I didn't like these beats in relation to that particular story. That's cool, constructive criticism. But when somebody's ripping you apart. Just because you're not going by the status quo, yeah. What you know, I mean, what creator has what creators that actually you know, I mean, creation's all about breaking the mold, yeah. But and yes. that's what I'm talking about these strange, bitter, twisted people who they just seem to live their life. Obviously, they've not created much themselves, or they've put themselves in such a shaky pedestal that the thought of another creator appearing is a threat to them. It's yeah. going to, you know, I mean, they're instantly going to disappear. That whole thing about yes, relevance. yes. It's um, I don't understand that mentality, and it's always interesting to hear people's experiences of those type of, you know, yeah, I did encounter this person, and this is what they did to me. And you're like, why? Well, how can you sit like that? <laughs> you know, and and what can you learn if you're always saying things like that? Because life yeah. is about learning and bettering yourself and bettering your craft, and if you can't be constructive then somebody's just hurting you doing it to hurt you it's uh it's a very 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 strange mentality um thankfully uh like i said uh, i've only encountered that a few times and most times all i do is screenshot share with a group and go haha look at this get her girl you know <laughs> look at this have you ever had that before that's kind of my way of dealing with it i just point and laugh and go <clears throat> sucks to be them because if that's the life they're living and that's how they get fulfillment well i'm glad i'm not them and yeah, i'll never follow the rules tend to feel sorry for them yeah it's uh very strange but this is more prevalent now uh especially with social media um, and when you can be anonymous yeah because they're always they're they're super brave people <clears throat> when you can hide behind a cartoon character um yes or behind some text under a name to do this you know i mean likes yourself coming on forward, 
putting your face out there on camera shows them instantly that you're not afraid. Yeah. You know, um, oh, we've got Dale in the chat. I just thought her. Um, haters everywhere have to ignore them. Um, I would agree and disagree. Don't ignore them. Acknowledge their existence. Just don't feed them. Acknowledge their existence and laugh at them for what they are because if you weren't, by being a creator, you're instantly not being that person. <clears throat> That's the best way I can think of describing it. You know, if you're, if the only way you can look is the critical lens and tear people down and never yeah. give acknowledgement, you're not going to be a creator yourself because some of the guys got such a fragile ego that yeah. the first criticism they get, they'll just fall apart. Yeah. And the, the more you keep going, the more acceptance of your work you'll get and the more praise you'll get. And that overcomes any criticism. So was that your first time? Persevering. Yeah. Was that your first time dealing with one of those type of comments? Yeah. How, how yeah. did you find it? How did, what was your initial reaction? Well, I told my publisher <laughs> and she says, don't worry because more people will review your stuff and they'll have positive things to say. So this person is just a blip on the radar. So no, that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> sometimes, so, um, sometimes they even collect them, you know, put them all in a yeah, document and have like a, yeah. uh, here's and my get, trophy wall sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's true. It's just the more, time that you allow to go by the more positivity you'll get and just hold out for that because i think that what is always best when you've been criticized or anything that's happened like i've just been criticized just for just being criticized and the thing that helps is when other people come to you you don't say anything but then other people see you for who you are and they will stick up for you and it's the same thing with writing other people will read it and they'll see that it's good or they appreciate it and they their review is what sticks up for it is what sticks up for you what defends you against any negative people yeah fantastic um is it that whole and there's that whole fear of sticking your head above the parapet so to speak you know there's one thing having an idea in your head or <laughs> like you initially said you're writing for your daughter and that became a bonding experience you know uh which you're lucky position because a lot of people, some people don't have that. And that, that's what makes a family. I think, you know, that those things that um, <clears throat> make you bond that aren't forced and just happen naturally. But there's a heck of a difference between that and being creative for the sake of it and enjoyment. And then deciding to put yourself out there. When did that transition happen? I'm trying to think of the first thing that I had. Well, one of the first things I had published was a story about my recovery. It was into mm -hmm. Chicken Soup for the Soul book. And um, because that was received so well, and I was received in that community so well, I just, I felt like I could start to have courage to put what other things that I've written out there. Because that Chicken Soup story was just a, was a um, nonfiction, it was mm -hmm. an essay. So I continued on with the fiction that I had been writing. And that was a whole process of writing for me to actually have the courage to do that. And I can't remember exactly the first. The Staircase was one of the very first things I had written. And I sent it to, cause I, I sent it to, um, oh, I forget the name of them now. But anyway, they published it in one of their anthologies. And that gave me a lot of courage. I think you sent me, I think we have it in the original video, the, the link uh, yeah. for people to check it out. That was a lot of fun to do actually, because I love monsters and I was playing about with the, I think the shutters rattling and the storm. And I love that kind of atmosphere, <laughs> trying to make the atmosphere a character, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's always challenging to do, especially in audio. Um, yeah. It's, can you get somebody to put earphones in and be there? And that presented a nice challenge of. Okay, I liked it I in your this? Scottish and your Irish accent. Oh, thanks. Well, as long as people at first I thought you were that's... Scottish. All right, yeah, Northern Irish. I'm from the bit that got into a wee bit of trouble for a few decades, always fighting with each other. <laughs> but we're calming down now, you know, and behaving ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, no, thanks. Uh, it was a fun, it's fun to do because a story, if you can bring it to life and get it, get yourself immersed in it, that's when you know you've got something enjoyable. You know what I mean? The, the whole process of creation is, uh, while it could be painful at times, it's, it's fun because when you start to see development and you start to see something come alive, that's just a concept. It's fantastic. Um, I should have mentioned, you do write across genres. Have you found your experience in the sort of horror genre or stepping in that different from others? Or are there beats that, um, are there beats that transfer uh, across all genres or is there something unique about horror? Um, yeah, I like the, I just like the, it must be the Scottish in me because I like the really dark haunting kind of things. The like not really out there horror, but I like the really spooky kind of psychological horror where just the really haunting things. I like I like Wuthering Heights because that's mm -hmm. so haunting. It's like not horror, but it's just so haunting. And then um I've got some I like Dracula. And no, that's kind of the an Irish writer. Mr. Stoker, yep. Um, it might sound like heresy, but I actually liked um, the remake with, uh, oh my word, I'm going to forget his name, Gary Oldman, as oh, opposed yeah. to the original with, uh, although the original with Christopher Lee and Vincent Price is amazing. Um, Kenneth Branagh, was it Kenneth Branagh remade it? I think it was Kenneth Branagh, uh, re remade Dracula. Oh, he did? With, um, it was Gary Oldman and uh, what's her face? I'm Why not the writer? That's her, yes. I was like, characters' names okay with actors' names. I'm like, uh, who? Oh, yeah, her, yeah. <laughs> like her. Um, yeah, I, I thought that, that actually uh, brought the story more to life. Just give it a, just use a bit more of modern techniques to tell an already great story. Um, Obviously, the book's fantastic as well. Read it multiple times. Yeah. The uh, Nosferatu. Oh, yes. Uh, that was really good. That just turned 100 this year. Did it really? Mm -hmm. The, the wow. original screenplay. Yeah, we, uh, wow. 1922, I think. Come out. Well, that was it. That was Bram Stoker was caught up in this whole um, plague thing. In, in Ireland when he was there and he'd see the, the people getting buried alive and or, you know and they're still a little bit alive and that was a fear of his and a fear of uh, people during that time and in that era so he I think Dracula kind of arises out of that fear of being buried alive and mm -hmm. Frankenstein kind of kind of comes out of the fear of people that was it was during the time when people had like the body the resurrectionist that would dig up the body and and sell the body for parts for the anatomy students so everybody was afraid of that happening to them and and frankenstein kind of rises out of that fear so the the cool thing about it is that these these fears and this kind of psychological horror kind of rises out of people's own fears and it makes people confront their fears and it tangible way or way that they can accept and yeah um, and that's always the best we'll always say the the most the worst monster is human you yeah. know the things that we can do to each other and yeah. with each other and you know make each other uh, sometimes a quick death better than some things you can actually live through and that's what i think just provides a tapestry for this whole genre um but have you found your interaction with um people or fans different in this genre maybe it's having that understanding makes it slightly different but um have you found it to be more positive negative or have the questions been different that people ask you when you you're sort of dipping into horror as opposed to other i'm sure it's definitely completely different from your non-fiction work you'll have a completely yeah. different audience with completely different focus yeah um i think it's it's more it's it's really positive because it well, like that comment that we were talking about, the mm -hmm. derogatory comment that we were talking yes. about, uh, that that um, the stuff that they were talking about that didn't even happen in my story. <laughs> and so it's just like as 
as a writer, I can know that this really doesn't have relevance because this isn't even in my story. This wasn't even part of my story. So it's it's just that and you can kind of go along. And that's what gives you confidence as a writer. It makes you feel like you can plow through these things and you can persevere and you can tackle another project. Whether it, don't let it scare you off that, that um, one particular genre, whatever, whatever genre it is, but then, you know, you can still persevere in that because you know what you've written. Mm -hmm. Do you think when you get that, that helps you? No, I mean, you get it out of the way, right? I've got my first troll. Yay, I'm still here. Do you think it's good to get that just done and out of the way as quickly as possible? Well, it's it's just, it's, it's like what you were saying, though. It's just so hard to fathom that somebody would actually waste the precious time they have on this earth to be negative towards somebody else for no reason when they didn't even read anything. And it's not even constructive criticism, but it's just for the sake of negativity. And it's mm -hmm. like, why would you waste your time doing that? And I think it's because of, of my accident. You know that time is so precious, you only have so much here. And you don't want to waste it doing that. So Yeah, I suppose you have one of them moments. Uh-oh, that could have been it. Done, dusted, finished. No more. And then that sort of gets the old juices going. Like, oh, right, okay. That, that was close. Every day now is precious. That's it. Yeah. Going for it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't want to waste your time in in negativity. Oh no, no, it's uh, it's the worst thing ever. I like um like I always I'm against the word debate. I don't like debate because that means there has to be a winner. You know, and it's usually a competition or an antagonistic stand, standpoint. I like discourse and discussion because that's where you can go over ideas. Yeah. But it's almost impossible, especially today, to have that, especially in social media. Um just recently, uh, I tried talking about, you know, the new Hellraiser movie came out. Um, or I was trying to, somebody was talking about Hellraiser Revelations, which is quite arguably the worst movie ever produced. <laughs> and I found a documentary about why it was the worst movie ever produced. I wanted to have a conversation about it. Yeah, yeah. And I went, oh, well, here's a documentary about what happened. And all I got in return was, yeah, it still sucks though. I'm like... Not oh, I that. think that would be so creative. But I'm like, yeah, I'm not talking about it. I'm not defending the movie. I'm trying to discuss why and what yeah. the falls and how it can happen. That's that's my jam. You know, if something is absolutely terrible, let's find out why it happened. What were the events? And then we can know what to look out for. And like even the conversations of something's being promoted. Now the language being used kind of gives you red flags about whether something's going to be good or not. Yeah. Because if somebody's coming in like really antagonistic and the thing isn't even out yet, be it a book or a movie, you're kind of getting the red flags of, oh, this isn't going to be very good because they're starting the, the battle already before the thing's even out. It's like, if you were to put out a book, um, and we're going to talk about one of your recent um, uh, spinners, oh my God, Macbeth spinners. Macbeth spinners. I, <laughs> I do take notes. I promise I do take notes, but it just, <laughs> like I warned you at the start, this conversation goes all over the place and I try and bring myself up. Yeah. But if you were putting out my guest winners, go, and if you don't watch this book, you're a horrible person. And I hate your guts. And you haven't, the book hasn't even come out yet. People are like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And that's the mentality of these people. It's mental. Yeah. I've oh, got some more people in the chat as well. Um, Spider Master, I'm working on my Splatoon horror movie. Is that a is that a take on Platoon? The the war movie? No. Or is that a genre? Splatoon, or gives a wee bit more context. Spider Master would be uh, Spider Master would be uh, interested in what you're talking about. But um, yeah, that's that's great. People, um, and that's why I love conversations. I guess because you don't know who's watching. Thinking, there, I can have a go. And it could be fantastic. It could be terrible. But that's at least you're trying. That's not yeah. a minute uh, wasted. Um. So we're talking about when you you first come on, you saw what we were about, and you, you liked it and joined in. How important is it for people to collaborate and work together? Because there's just a there's this idea of yeah, everybody can be a superstar just by putting themselves out there, but the reality is that's not the case. Um, it's so hard to get noticed. While there's accessibility, it's so hard to get noticed. So how important is it for collaboration and uh, 
working together? Well, it's important to find like-minded people. People who think that horror is what you think horror is, it's not, which is what I like the spooky ambiance of your publication. And, and I, th I was drawn to that. I was just drawn to the spookiness of it. It didn't seem like mm -hmm. right out there horror, but just the ambiance of it. So I think it's just like-minded people. And you, if you have the same, the same kind of end route or end game, then that, the, linking people together that can really help mm -hmm. uh yeah and that's what we try to do here you know it's just the love of the genre um try yes. to bring that across because there's so much um which is very strange but there's so much negative connotations with horror and people have a perception of horror fans horror creators and it couldn't be further from the truth and the more we have these conversations the more it gets the point gets proven oh, guess what? We're actually not complete cycles because we get that out of our system by what we'll watch or what we'll watch. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. are the ones that should be worried in other genres because we're fine. We, we get out of our system. We don't care. So we can be happy. We're the most mentally stable. Do you think there's something about that? Uh, like you mentioned, just starting creating was a form of catharsis and therapy. Um, yes. Is there a need for people to explore the dark side of things? Do we have to do that? Or can we go through life without it? Um, I don't think. And no, I don't. Do not think you can go through life without it. I think you need to, but I think it's, it's it, not just look at it, but it just to really face it and to really feel it. And then, if you really, really feel it, you really face your fears. Like the people in around Frankenstein were afraid of their bodies being snatched and everything, and then they face that fear through this book and it, it Dracula they face their fears of plague through Dracula it's a mm -hmm. human need to actually look at something in the face and know that it's it makes you feel like it's overcoming it when you face it in art I think mm -hmm. one, one of the tropes in horror is obviously the mirror and I think there's a bit uh, kind of plays into that uh, you know the beast, you know, I mean, the face in the mirror and what looks back at you. Um, I think that's why it's one of the, like, Prince of Darkness, for example, is a movie that freaked me out as a kid. Just the whole, uh, the whole idea, the concept, and the fact that hell was a liquid, you know, just a, it was a strange concept. <laughs> but once again, that early on of looking into the mirror. Um, yeah. And Dracula has a scene with the mirror. Yeah. And, and that was the whole thing with vampires as well, because they can't look into the mirror, so they're not human. Mm -hmm. So there's almost like that subtext as well of they can't look at themselves. If they did, they'd see the monster. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. there's a lot to be said. Um, yeah. From a game release uh, made by And Nintendo. I think that's why psychological, why, why uh, horror stuff is so cathartic for the writers is because you are looking at something straight on and you're understanding it instead of just being afraid by it. Yeah, and that takes a um, it takes a bravery in itself. Yeah, to be able to look at that and go, well, actually, do you know what? I'm okay. Because the earliest warnings always, if you start in the abyss, the best stirs back. Yeah. Where I think I think a horror creator's like, yeah, well, have a look, here I am, come on. <laughs> <laughs> right they want to know why. Give they me ideas. It. <laughs> They're looking in the abyss, going, "Who's that weirdo?" <laughs> well, horror fans again. Ah, go away. <laughs> Uh, what challenges did you face? Because obviously we're talking about online, uh, sort of, you know, it is so accessible, but at the same time, so difficult to get out there. What challenges did you face initially trying to get yourself, your brand built up and known? And how did you work to overcome them? Uh, that is so hard to answer because I'm still right there, I feel like. I'm... It never ends. <laughs> it's just still there. Well, have you seen... Like, you kind of got your start point and where you are now, because it never we're still working here, do you know what I mean? But when you first started out, and all this is, like, brand new, and as a creator yourself, you know, what hurdles did you see, and how did you approach each one as you came across? My biggest hurdle was myself. Mm -hmm. the, the fear of actually being put out there. And... Um, 
the more success I had, the more confidence I had to continue putting myself out there. But it's that's the biggest hurdle was just my own fears. But then the more it's it's like anything, it's like anything in the horror genre. If you're afraid of it, understand it. Mm -hmm. That's it's the call to learn about it and call to understand it. And that helps. So. So talk about negative. Say when you first got your first. Uh, when you got your first uh, positive comment, not from immediate friends and family, because we all have those people um, to help us get there, because sometimes you don't want to do it, and people, uh, I've got a bunch of friends always read my stuff and will tell yeah. me, and that's good. Yeah. But that first stranger that approached you and said, I really love your work, how did that affect you? I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. There's a a couple of counter interviews too that's not on the same site about my present work for they had really nice things to say and i i love that but then there's a part of you that kind of thinks well read it again make sure <laughs> are you sure about that though yeah but but it's it's really needed though it's just you need it but then the bottom line i think is writing for yourself and writing mm -hmm for where you feel led to write and getting out of yourself what you feel you need to get out of it's it's almost it's almost kind of like an exorcist writing mm -hmm. do you need to get something out so you exercise it by writing about it so i think that's been a lot of what's happened to me Yeah, come with me after um yeah um a lot of people like people have been asking me about podcasts and stuff and i always say you have to have something to talk about. You have to have a reason for doing it. Yeah. Um, fame means nothing. Money means nothing. Um, getting past. Oh yeah, money's not nothing. even a question. No, it's no, definitely not. But uh, I, I think not be for saying, the money, not for the anything. Yeah, it's that need to do it. Yeah. And to be able to do it's it. It's a labor of in, love. Mm -hmm. Everything else after that, you know, it's a bonus. Yeah. But first and foremost, by doing it for yourself and going, can I actually write for an hour and not be pushed, you know, as and enjoy the experience? Yes, the technical stuff's all fine, but do I have an idea that I want to express? Um, I think there's some people just that try to, you, you see uh, a lot of people jump through trains and the, they're always jumping on the bandwagon and they don't seem to have a thought in their own head. And we see a lot of this in the, Hollywood, for example, you know, they don't have a thought in their own head. They just jump and remake and rehash and jump on trends to get it. Um, it's kind of sad, you know, it's just, you just wonder what, uh, they may have to become a job and not a labor of love, like you said. Yeah. Um, how do people avoid that? By writing for yourself and not writing for anybody else, not writing for any genre or like you were saying earlier, formula or <clears throat> just write for yourself, write what you feel that you need to write and write to get out of yourself, what you feel that you need to get out through your writing. It, for me, it was cathartic and therapeutic and it, it helped me so much. And I think that that is the whole purpose of writing for me. Have you found yourself struggling to write at one point or are you in the mindset of I'm doing it because it's good for me and if I don't need to do it right now, that's fine too. Are you kind of at that point or have you now got a need that you've opened this door to continually do something? Because you know why a lot of writers talk about, oh, I haven't done anything in a six months. I'm a terrible person yeah. or I've got writer's block just because I don't have an idea. Do you suffer from that or is it a completely different experience for you, your creative the, process? Yeah, the only thing that stops me in my tracks is when I'm trying to write to succeed and to like make money from it and mm -hmm. you know from the creative process trying to make money from a feeling feeling like pressured to be successful at something i've written right that um, was part of my last question you know um the two how do you regulate yourself then from the reality of i need a product to sell as opposed yeah. to i'm doing yeah. this for me to put something out there how do you balance those two aspects yeah. Well, that pressure of trying to succeed in writing is what 
stops me. Then mm -hmm. I feel like I have no inspiration and I just, I can't write. But if I'm writing for myself and what I feel like I'm inspired by, and I kind of delve into what I feel inspired by and just do it as a labor of love, then there's no end to the writing and the inspiration. But so, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's okay. I was going to say, so do you have a technique now that you can recognize that? Or is it still a continual thing? It's, it's pretty continual. It's pretty continual because there's it, it always sneaks up on you where you feel pressured to succeed. And you feel mm -hmm. pressured to make some money. And I'm always checking myself for that because I'm always thinking that's not why I'm doing it. Because when I think about that and I feel the pressure, then nothing happens. So you actually go against your own goals by thinking about exactly your, your journey, your exactly life. exactly when the creative process process happens is when there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. so. Um. In addition, you're not just an author. You actually provide mentorship and training courses to other writers, uh, which is a step above you know beyond just yourself. What made you transition to that period? Because that's that's quite a big thing. There's one thing being a master of your own craft. There's one thing doing your thing for you, but it's completely a separate thing, involving yourself in another human being and trying to be inspiring and uplifting. That is a lot of energy you're putting into someone else. Yeah. What made you decide, I want to go this direction? That in my teacher from um, my master's group, degree program class he mm -hmm. he was my mentor and uh for this for my essay on uh frankenstein during when he was in the arctic the bookends of frankenstein he was my my mentor for that and he helped me through that essay it took a semester to write and um i he's he's my inspiration for that because i wanted to help somebody how he was helping me mm -hmm. And he just, he would, he would help me to learn to write. And these, just like these, it, I thought he did such courageous things because he would move one sentence over to the beginning where it was one of my ending sentences. He would move it toward the beginning and it sounded so much better. And I thought this is so courageous. So I, I the real courage comes in writing is just when you can move around your structure and you can see what sounds best. It's just... Yeah, sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees. So the saying goes, you know, you're just so wrapped up in the movement. You need that third eye, you know, someone looking yeah. over the shoulder to go, okay. But they're not. And you say, I believe part. in you too. Because mm -hmm. I knew he believed in me. So how does that work? How have you found the relationship with uh, your writers then? Um, do you have to lay it out at the start what do you expect the relationship to be? Have you had to explain it along the way? What's your approach then when dealing with a new writer? Because if it's somebody new, obviously we've, we've talked about this as a start, um, there's that nervousness, there's the fragility because they haven't done it before, that whole fear of I'm going to get shot down the minute I stick my head up. Um, and then there's also somebody who's maybe been doing it for a while, maybe built up a bit of uh, thick skin <clears throat> in terms of resistance against yeah. uh, any sort of criticism because of that with negativity. Have you had to have those discussions along the way? Yeah. Or has it just been straight into the writing? Yeah, it's just important to center yourself and remember why you're doing it. Always mm -hmm. keep that in mind, why you're doing it, and then you'll have your mindset on your inspiration. But and obviously, without naming names, obviously, don't, don't go into confidentiality, but are there particular conversations you've had to have where you've had to explain your position and your motivations why you're doing it so that your constructive criticism wasn't taken the wrong way? Yeah, not personally, but I've written about it. All right. So has it been generally positive with your writers then? Yeah. Do they know what you're about? That's what, that's what I'm kind of trying to ask. Yeah. Have you kind of set that precedent at the beginning of your relationship with a writer that you're mentoring? Well, kind of not per se, but just it's more of a process mm -hmm. more of a process my my uh what am i trying to say my whole my whole uh 
basis in that my whole my whole thought process it was was my teacher and how mm. he mentored me and it was just an in process thing as you go along and it was really it was really amazing it was really a very thorough it's more thorough so you've kind of taken inspiration from those techniques that helped you and you're just um replicating them have yeah. you had to switch that up because not everybody's you no know I mean it's a one-to-one -one relationship's unique and each end of it you know each human being like every time i pop on this i genuinely don't know what i'm going to get till we start talking and there's always that bit of oh is this is this going to go well not um i'm going to say the wrong thing you know you've always got that bit do you have that when you start with a new writer or have you found a bit where your experience you know you're you're channeling your experience with your mentor have you had that challenged when dealing with someone else and then had to rethink how you approach things no not not really because it's it, it's the same it's the same as remembering why you write you're doing it as a labor of love you're doing it for yourself and it's it's the same thing and it's just trying to fill somebody else with understanding that it's their inspiration would be by the writing mm -hmm. not for anyone else not so that anyone else thinks that they should continue doing it or they should not or they should go into something else i've had people tell me i should go into a different kind of writing somebody says you should write in this genre you'd be really good in this genre but you just have to ignore that and you just have to the most important thing that i wanted to emphasize is that you're doing this for your own inspiration for your you just yourself mm. and there's something to say you can take that on board and if something inspires you there's nothing stopping you to do it but yeah um people can get excited um, and excited for you but then it's not to get swept up in the demands of the audience because then you can just spread yourself too thin and then you you lose yourself um you see that with so many people are just pure ego driven though they're they've um they've got the people whispering in their ear all the time and they kind of become detached and you can come back and go that wasn't the same person that i started following the uh they're actually completely different and i don't know who this is in front of me um is that all something you keep in the back of your mind not to get swept away yeah 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 you have to you just you, you have to start from the from the beginning almost every time mm -hmm. yeah so is everything just a process then just um okay here's the next thing back to the beginning forget yeah, all it before. has to be it it has to be for me, it has to be. I don't. I think I'd be lost if it wasn't, and it would be too much pressure. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the thing I can't deal with. I can't deal with the pressure. So, I, no, it's kind of its own base itself. You know, it just it, yeah. it's not and even really the thing you're doing. It's just this external strange force that crushes yes, everything and that that's past. where I when that pressure comes into play is when I get to be my own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever put you under pressure or is it all self-generated? Oh, people have. Yeah. <laughs> they make you feel like, well, you shouldn't be doing this if you're not successful and you're not making money at it. Then that's where that's where the pressure comes in. You're you're not you're not really successful. You're not really a writer because you're not making money. <laughs> you're not a real author. How many times have you heard that? Yes. What what is a real author? I've, I've tried to distill this because um, part of this show is people think there's only one path. And one thing we have unlocked with these conversations, there, there isn't. And people don't always stick to, even though you choose your own way, I have people who are traditionally published in addition to being self-published because what's not good for the publisher that can express themselves in their own way under a different pen name. I've had people cross genres of people, small press, large press you know um they're they're not bound but there's always this question comes up you're not a real writer unless you're not a real author at what point do you have that recognition of yes i'm a writer or is there a difference between being a writer and an author let's let's get that into semantics is there a difference between that yeah yeah i feel like an author and i i don't know how long i felt like that because Throughout my whole entire writing career, I've been told that I'm not making money of it. So it's not really, you know, I'm not really writing. I'm not really mm -hmm. exist. I'm just, I'm doing it as a hobby. 
And I think when you realize that, no, I'm not doing as a, as a hobby, this is who I am, then I think you're an author. Have these people ever met hobbyists? Have they what? Ever met a hobbyist? Right, ever. a true hardcore hobbyist in any genre. Now, I come from a wargaming background, um, comic books, you name it. You meet a hardcore <laughs> hobbyist and they will put any professional to shame. They will, like, uh, I used to collect Warhammer 40,000. People there that actually study the lore behind it's a board game, you know, what I mean, it's a tabletop board game where you play with tiny soldiers and you roll dice. That's you play Dungeons, what it is. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeon, in fact, I'm going to be playing my son, and my son the has a whole Dungeons and Dragons group where they always right. play on Wednesdays. You tell me that there's not a professional level of a DM writing a campaign and everyone investing in their characters, right? Silly wee character sheet, you're, you spend your 16 points. You tell me, they would actually put Hollywood actors to shame in the <laughs> level they invest in that character. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, yeah. So, yes. How... And, Sorry, I, how... and, and I also know that too because my son, who is part of this dungeon, who has his Dungeons and Dragons group, he, um, he did the cover art. He's done the cover art for all of my books. Mm -hmm. And he does cover art, or he does art for uh, Dungeons and Dragons characters, and they come up to him and they'll be so adamant about what their characters are like and everything, and he'll draw that, he'll paint it digitally. So. Yeah, and you try and get that from a boardroom, it's going to an advertiser of I want this image to look like that. So you just get airy furry. So don't ever tell me that a hobby is dismissive because yes. unless you've met hobbyists you don't understand the level of intensity research and dedication it goes into that particular hobby that sounds so much like my son <laughs> but yourself as you know I mean, if if somebody ever tells you you're a hobbyist go thanks very much i didn't really yeah. that professional yeah yeah it's it's funny these people that seem to be denigrate others don't understand what they're actually talking about or the words that come out of their mouth it's yeah. just hilarious to me yeah yeah exactly so what that's was... what people need to know too mm -hmm. yeah and it's just um and that's why i always say don't stop yes don't let anyone mm -hmm. unless you're not enjoying it anymore i think that's the point if it becomes a chore the, or the pressure the pressure can make you not enjoy it though you've yeah. got it that's why you have to get rid of the pressure in order to enjoy it and not feel any pressure because i mean there's been times there's been times when my son has hated his art because he feels under pressure and mm -hmm. been times for that that i've hated writing because i it's the pressure and when you get rid of that pressure, then that's when you can be free. And that's when you can write for yourself and your own inspirations. Well, like you were saying at the very start, do you think the same mentality as facing your fears in terms of horror, do you think that can be applied to facing and dealing with pressure? Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it happens mostly by accident. <laughs> that's very good. This is very insightful. Really good. Do you think that's that can be applied um like breaking down the whys what is the pressure where's the pressure coming from yeah what is success what is making money um exactly yeah oh. you have to realize that and you have to face it and you have to i'm not gonna do that i'm not believing in that anymore sorry not playing today <laughs> i'm yeah, cracking on yeah it's a it's, it the Sorry. same part of this it's very similar to mentoring it's just that you you just face what your fear is and you overcome it that way you you have to really understand why you're afraid mm -hmm. has mentoring helped you in a sense so you're encouraging someone else has that helped you recognize some things that are going on with yourself yes yes could you give yes, an example always Oh, excuse me. Can you give an example of when that happened or when you had an epiphany, you were explaining to somebody and then oh. you're like, oh no, that happened to me. And then the wheels clicked. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could, but now I'm feeling just, just, I feel a little, I, I my thoughts don't come boom like that. All right. 
I'm sorry. My no, no, memory's no, no. kind of hard to come by. If it, if it jumps in, just um, we'll pop it on. I will. Like I said, these, are, um, <laughs> these aren't stellar. Like, half of these questions are not even on my list. That's that's what I said. It just comes to mind. Oh, actually, can you tell us when? Because <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting journey. And that, well, I've got some. I've got notes here, so I don't forget stuff because I forget everything. Yeah, it's totally. my you, is, you it's my right problem. Yeah. So, but that's, that's that's all right. That's the joys of going live as well because. I think people are sick and tired of seeing um, sanitized. Um, I don't want to use the word professional because we've. We've had that discussion, you know, what is professional? It's just the dedication you put into something. It doesn't mean, I think people are sick of the studio, you know, and that's why podcasting and these sort of chats, people don't want to see a facade anymore. Yeah. They, they want to see you and how you react. So never ever apologize or be worried about, oh, I haven't done this beat for beat or scripted because yeah, people don't want that anymore, honestly. It's, uh, I hear it, like, who watches TV, you know, as in normal network TV these days? Well, you you're, you make me very comfortable, too, on here. And that's a, that's very important to me because that's part of my, was part of my injury in my accident mm -hmm. was it took out a lot of my memory. So that's why it's so hard for me to, I mean, I really have to focus myself and mm -hmm. allow for time to kind of remember something. And so, oh, that's and cool. that's hard for people to understand. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. But the whole point of this is not to make people feel uncomfortable. I mean, what's the point? I'm not here. It's not about me talking. It's here. Uh, everyone get to know you, Justine. You know what I mean? That's that's the point, purpose of this here. Um, get a bit of appreciation behind the camera and the, th the sort of thought process that goes on. You know, that's what we're, that's what it's all about here. And just yeah. have a bit of fun while we're at it, you know. Yeah. Because, uh, like I said, uh, people are moving away from it. Like, network TV and those... Um, talk shows and panels nobody watches them anymore no they've been a dead medium because it's so fake and contrite yeah. and i think a lot of people even though they engage the whole gotcha cut questions with the media ah caught you out you know what what does that achieve in the world it's uh it's just pointlessness you know uh i don't understand like i said it's back to the troll it's back to that yeah. person rips people apart what does that achieve in life Maybe it's a way for people to face their fears is to see other people going through what they're afraid of. But it's more fun in the ho in the horror genre rather yeah, than think... just watching a talk show and seeing your fears come out that way. <laughs> it's more fun yeah, with the so. ambiance and the whole spookiness and and just embrace it and have fun. I think. Um, yeah. Instead of I, watching I laugh people more. yelling at each other on camera. Yeah. I, that's why I've given up on a lot of other franchises, and that's why I, I, I've kind of stayed in the horror bubble. For so long. I might watch something to cleanse a palate or read something to cleanse a palate now and again, but generally, I'm having too much fun here. I laugh more in the horror genre than I would in a comedy. That is so good. Yeah, that's so um, good. In fact, Dale, one of our guests on tonight, we've been on talking about a movie, and we were absolutely like tears streaming down our face at the ridiculousness of a movie we reviewed. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Horror is fun to write. Yep, that is. Yeah. It's fun to write. It's fun to read. Um, what was the movie? Um, Killer Sofa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, oh, it was bad. <laughs> it, was just, it, was even beyond the, it was even beyond the so bad it's good sort of <laughs> level of terrible. It's just um, even laughing now thinking about it. Um, <laughs> like one of our best chats, but there is a thing, there is a glee, I think, in horror that makes people outside the genre wonder what the hell is wrong with you. Yeah. And the thing is, um, a lot of horror creators seem to feel like they have to apologize. Or they think for, you're a dark person. Yeah, or it's not high art. I've, I've heard that before, no hang ups people oh. have. I, yes. I don't even know what that means, but it's, you know, if you're in a certain, yeah. if people are having that conversation with you, it's like, yeah. what do you say about, are you ashamed to be a horror creator? Yeah. Are you ashamed to be, to create horror? Me personally? Yeah. No, no, I think, I think it's so, 
in depth and so psychological when it's when it's not just blood and guts like on camera with they I think that's just kind of that's a pop like it's effect. probably it's, it's, the attack of the killer sofa was probably yeah. you know, like that <laughs> Yeah, just that. In fact, it wasn't. It was more. There was very few kill scenes. It was just a oh. It was just ridiculous. Yeah, it was. Um, what the movie was presented at, what we were expecting, and what we got was completely different. <laughs> it was yeah, but I. One. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's. I I like the really psychological stuff. That have you seen the ring? Yes. I like that. that uh, kind of on the original that, Ringo, the Japanese version. The uh, the remake. Oh, the remake, oh, yes. I, I can't forget the name of the lady. Naomi Watts, maybe? Yes. That was scary. Oh, and what was funny about that movie was um, she thought she was doing good by Len, um didn't call her Hideko, and uh, I can't remember the English name, you know what I mean, the, the original Japanese, but she thought she was laying the ghost to rest. But what she actually did was release a demon. Yeah, yeah. Because that was a whole bit at the end. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's you... what we're talking about—the American version because um, they didn't quite uh, do it in the Japanese version. But in the American version, it was she was going through, found her body, and I can't remember the American name she used for the girl. Uh, that, that's what I'm struggling with here. Um, starts but with the an girl... S. I, I can't remember the name. Yeah. Uh, but by finding her and finding her body, she thought she was doing the right thing. And by copying the tape, she thought she was doing the right thing of giving the spirit peace. But it turns out <laughs> she actually released a demon instead. Yeah. And then yeah, that's, was... uh, that was the kind of, oh. <laughs> yeah. And then kind of, kind of more campy, but also just as fun. Have you ever seen Jeepers Creepers? Oh, yes. Um, I haven't seen the... Uh, fourth one yet reborn no i heard that's pretty terrible i haven't got a chance to see that yet um <laughs> but, but first i one, love that movie i thought it's yeah. so fun it was not that truck um like that was a character in itself <clears throat> yes and that's where like i said i love atmosphere i love character building and it doesn't have to be the monster or the human antagonist it can be a device or a setting and yeah. they've made that truck as much of a character as the creeper yes yeah which yeah. uh fun itself they kind of expanded on it and then went a bit too far by the third one the third one wasn't um great oh really <laughs> yeah <kind laughs> i don't of, think i've seen like all one. franchises once once the money makers get involved and in real oh this can make money then they start just beating it to death yeah but that's that's another thing about horror though that's i was watching those during the beginning stages of my recovery and it's just mm -hmm. it unleashes a creativity in you you just my mind can kind of wander off onto other paths and it just unleashes just thoughts and creativity Besides, samara was the name of the yes girl. samara, yes, samara yep. I was kept thinking Harako, the, the Japanese name, I couldn't remember. So, <laughs> so I was nice of it. But yeah, um, horror is so much fun. And that's and people don't give a credit, I think, where it's yeah. due. Yeah. Have you found your experience in the horror genre transfer over to some of your other writings? Has there been ideas or beats or that, not necessarily the darkness side of it, but has there been other beats of horror that's maybe come across into some of your other work yeah i i think so i think because just because i'm drawn to that i'm just kind of drawn to going in deep and i think when people go in deep they find something that scares them mm -hmm. that's not safe when you go into yourself really deep there's always something that scares you and it's it horrors just facing your fears in whatever visual form that takes Oh, yep. there's always this debate as well um and actually with your latest work macbeth spinners it's kind of fallen into that of what is horror and as usual your generic fan or internet person that is the expert in everything but knows nothing at the same time are always the first to denigrate and say that's not horror 
that's not horror. This is horror. And it's back to the slasher popcorn. Like, <laughs> they think everything's that. Your latest book, uh, Macbeth Spinners, which we're going to be featuring soon, um, it, you've classed it more as dark fantasy. Um, where does the line draw between like fantasy, dark fantasy, till it actually reaches horror? At what point is there a particular line that gets crossed? Or is it more the sort of feeling of the piece? How do you define it? I'm not, I think the line is really blurred <clears throat> for me because it just, dark fantasy is just, is reaching into the deepest parts of yourself and you're going to find something scary there. And I think that horror, horror does that, but it may be, it takes it more of an outward appearance. appearance. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So horror, you're more facing your fears and fantasy. Maybe it's more internalized. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, is the magical element because fantasy um, has quite a, a magical basis, um, which has been part of horror as well. You know, what I mean, supernatural creatures. Which yeah, my complaint about modern cinema is they're kind of deconstructing the vampire, the werewolf, the zombie, and they're kind of making a homogenous mess. You know, what I mean, because they're trying to insert sounds into a magical creature and rationalize it, and then. When you take strip away the magic from something, it's nothing anymore. Um, yeah. and even the frightening bit, but fantasy has always had a strong root in magic. Yeah. Um, is it what you do with that magic takes it towards a horror direction or the situation? What what does it sort of go? What goes from a fantasy to a dark fantasy, for example? Because I've read um, like I'm a massive fan of Raymond E. Feist, for example. And a lot of his themes are quite dark. You know, he's a, he's a fantasy series. Um, the Riff War, I don't know if you're familiar with it. The, okay, so it, it was a long you know, I mean, long standing series, about 30 books. Um, but it was a fantasy series, but there was quite a lot of dark elements because of dealing with the mad god sort of thing, you know, it's trying to come through in the universe. Um, and some of the warlocks, you know, some of the things they would do would be classed as horror, you know, and these are scenes in on the shelf fantasy books. So where does that line kind of, where do you start getting drawn towards that? That it, it's not just an element in a fantasy, but it becomes dark fantasy. Is there a percentage or is there a theme or when does it happen? I think the more fearless the characters are mm-hmm. is when I think it becomes darker because they're not afraid of the darkness. They're not afraid to of what they don't know. They're not afraid of the unknown but they can go there and they don't know what they're going to face. And I don't know what they're going to face writing it, but I keep going there because they want to go there. All right. So it probably doesn't make sense. No, I can get Cause horror is always a threat of it. Like uh, the demon stepping through the mirror or the, the, the veil between the dark and the light being, you know, penetrated. But when it actually is, that it's in our world now, is that what you're trying to say? So when the yeah. veil is actually torn down and the darkness is already here, <clears throat> does it almost leave horror and go into Is it the other way around then? Because we always maybe talk about horror about things coming into the uh, genre, but is this an example in dark fantasy of horror leaving and going into something else as opposed to the other way around? Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know if this was what you were talking about, but the thing that I think was so scary in The Ring was when in that scene where she where the, the she's looking at the fly on screen and then all of a sudden the fly is real mm-hmm. and crawling on the outside of the screen. I think it's just when it when it leaves your imagination and comes into the world. So that yeah, the veil gets torn down. There's no yeah. there's no protection anymore. Yeah, that, that's why I remembered that scene with the fly in the ring. Yep. Because you were talking that about was so the veil. subtle as well. Because Anyone talks about the ring actually, it's always the same with Samara coming out of the TV. Mm-hmm. That's like the iconic scene. That's become one of the iconic scenes in horror. But yeah, it's just something simple like a fly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there you go. You're you're straight away. Oh, that's not there anymore. It's here. Oh dear. Did you know, I it's... really see that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of those one of the aspects I have actually, you know the unreliable narrator and uh sort of horror movies, do you think they help or take away? Um, 
something that really I find difficult to go along with. Um, and actually, I saw quite a bit of it in that recent movie, Halloween Ends. I watched that yesterday, where the really? character doesn't know whether it's real or their imagination. Is it good? <laughs> nah. Was Jamie Lee Curtis good? She was better than uh, the first two in the, that trilogy. Her character improved. Okay. But it wasn't enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I did a whole review on it yesterday when I came back from cinema. Um, but to have this whole thing with another character, the unreliable narrator, where, like you just said, is this real? Is it not real? Do you think that helps with the trope or does it take away? Because I, I find it really distracting. In horror, yeah. you know, it can be played with a bit, but I think when it goes too far, there has to be a point. And I think not at the end. I always hit that twist in the end where, yeah, it's real, it's not real. To me, that the realism is what makes something scary or not. Yeah. So when they play it off as, um, oh, it's it's a, uh, his breakdown, it's something in his mind. Um, yeah. There's a series of watch star, The Midnight Club, where they're playing everything off as their medication. And they're playing that bait the whole way through 10 episodes of a series until the very end. Um, I find that very distracting and takes away from yeah. horror. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Is there anything else that you can think of that sort of pulls you out? You know what I mean? There are things not to either overuse or use at all in horror, even though it's such a wide encompassing. Is there what, what does it take you out of the zone, so to speak? Blood. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, just too much blood because it's I, just horror for me is just the psychological aspect of it. There, I like one of my favorite writers is Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. All of his stuff is psychological. I love Telltale Heart. That's one of my favorites, and that's completely psychological. And in, in that story, it's kind of sore what you're describing because he's the protagonist is, you know, kind of contemplating killing this old guy that he works for. Mm -hmm. And it's just the whole thing is like, did he really do it? Did, did this really happen? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I can find that kind of um, off food. Um, seeing you mentioned uh, blood, one of my pet hates is digital blood in movies. That Ooh. has to be the most horrendous invention ever. <laughs> it just doesn't look good. Uh, There's no point. Um, when the story like is, I think when the story is done well, there's no point. Mm-hmm. For exaggeration. Because the digital blood is kind of exaggeration. It's just an exaggeration. Yeah, it, it just looks absolutely ridiculous. Um, That's one of the things with um, horror movies. Um, there seems to be a reliant, unless there's a massive budget, it's not going to be made well. Would you agree or disagree with that? Unless, Unless there's, there's a, a massive budget for special effects, for some reason we can't make horror movies. A lot of directors complain about it, you know, especially when movies have went bad. Oh, we didn't have enough budget for the special effects. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I disagree completely. I mean, just because I think the, the whole thing that's terrifying is really what's in your mind and your own fears. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it needs to play up with any effects because i think it's just it's really what you need to face in your own fears is the yeah the stories thing. are and the characterizations yeah. are yeah it, you know what i mean it doesn't have to be overdone that's why i think that's why the 80s some of the early 80s are still being held as like uh the epitome of creation because they didn't have the budget or they didn't have the technology so they had to rely on the story or i think now it's went the other way um that's always the that's always the benefit of reading, isn't it? That you can form the own picture in your head. Yeah. The concerning thing is though that less and less people are reading now. Does that worry you? Yeah. 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 Um because you're right. It's just when you read it's it's what you it's how you imagine the story and how you imagine the characters, how you imagine the fears. And that's what's scary. Instead of some, it, it's it's always like 
and all and the the campy stuff how you're talking about where it's exaggerated mm-hmm. it's somebody telling you this is what you need to be afraid of and this is what it's kind of like how we were talking about somebody saying this is what you need to write about this is where your story should go so it's it's just the movie director or whatever telling you this is what should scare you mm-hmm. when it should how do you think internal. we can get how do you think we can encourage more people to get back into reading again because um there's this whole thing about time you know i don't know if i can invest the time yet the same person can sit in their phone for like five hours straight but they won't pick up a book how do you think we can address that and encourage people back into sort of reading again because it's not a it's not a snobby thing to read you know i mean you can have reading at all levels how do you think we're going to address that balance because I think there's something going to be lost in the world if people move away from the written word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I knew. My my kids, I got a d- d- degree in um, <clears throat> English literature, and I write, mm-hmm. and my, none of my kids like to read. I have seven kids, seven of them, and mm-hmm. none like to read. And that, it kind of baffles me because they, they are always on their phones and, and all that kind of stuff, but... I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I think just good stories. Mm-hmm. People with but, people with okay, heart. You can write the best. You can write the best story in the world, but if nobody's actually going to pick up a book or uh, load it into their device, they're not going to. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Is how can we get people back in? Because it is a concern of mine that we're losing something, and that's maybe why we're not having as many ideas anymore because everything's kind of let out in visual form. That's true. And they're telling you what to think. Yep, and nobody's um, challenging that, especially with, the, like I said, social media. <laughs> everything has to be a battle, which is pointless, but everything has to be, you're either for or against, and having this team against that team, and it's really exhausting. What steps can we take? That's what I'm trying to think. How, how on earth can we start encouraging people with a bit of positivity, go right. Pick up a book, pick up a short book. You know, it doesn't have to be massive. Pick up um, an article, um, load it to your device. You know, is there a way we can bring this back, yeah. or are we kind of the last of a breed? Yeah, the thing that I think, though, the the thing, the thing that that um, I have in my class is you learn from you learn from who is trusted and proven, and you learn from the best. Mm-hmm that's how you learn to to write and to be the best you've got to learn from the best and you've got to go to people who like poe who Mm -hmm. they made movies from who they he just i mean now people read him as much as they're i don't know about as much but then but he's just as highly regarded yeah the sort of attack on him you know once again this is silly um you know these people on Twitter, you know, that have to tear down everybody. They start mm-hmm. attacking him for some reason, and it's like, get a grip. You know, they just, um, everything has to be brought down and destroyed and crashed and burned. And there's nothing else. It makes people feel up. better about themselves because they feel so lacking as a person. They've got to tear somebody else down to feel better about themselves. Are we back to the fundamentals then that horror is brilliant because we do that and that's why we're so happy? <laughs> and that's why we I, don't is, is that what we're back to horror is brilliant everybody get into horror because you'll actually it might scare you, you can a bit channel thing. channel all of all of your creative forces into this horror fixes everything yay yeah <laughs> One problem solved. yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean but the people during the era of poe when they would read his the Telltale Heart and everything that he wrote, <clears throat> and I can't think of a couple other. The uh, tip of my tongue, but 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 um, follow the House of Usher. I mean, but these were things that that led these people into into his world and made them feel like they were walking around into his world, and they could feel the face their own fears that way, and it made it feel safer. I think face their fears that way because it was in his world Mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of what 
if we could help people have the courage to keep doing that is I think where the answer is because and just encouraging people to enter somebody else's world and to just kind of be there for a while and as they're kind of pointing you around to their fears and you're kind of facing your own fears that way but that takes a lot of courage too mm -hmm. yeah you um, know i i i think that maybe because people don't read poe like they did they'll go to a horror movie instead it's, yeah it's easy accessibility and you know the but i mean you learn a lot of psychological stuff through reading poe you learn about your own fears you learn by learning about his fears Mm -hmm. in his world so yeah absolutely um like i said if we even just having this conversation encourages somebody to pick up a book then my job's done yeah Do you know what i mean if, yeah. if i get one person and get them to okay pick up a book or if i get an author if i get an author to sell one more book because we've done this my work's done that's that's the way i look at things because you can only really change the world or you can and, it, and it doesn't one. have to be straight horror either, too, or book mm -hmm. in the horror genre, because Jane Eyre, the mm -hmm. woman in the attic, was terrifying. And it, was, it wasn't it was a horror movie. It wasn't a horror book, but this, that one character was just terrifying because you had no idea what she was going to do. So it's, it that's kind of how genres can cross over like that. It's supposed to be a romance, but it was just horrifying because of a her. And there's something yeah. that you'd never hear in a million years, horror and romance yeah. across the board. That's something you yeah. never hear. Yeah. Fantastic. But she, she was the best and she did it. So. There you go. So most important question, Justine, what's what's down the pipeline for you? What, what projects have you got in development? Well, I'm working now on uh, publicizing Macbeth Spinners. And I... <clears throat> so that's that's my main my main effort now. Mm -hmm. And um what what this this how this how the genres cross over in my story was how I read that Shakespeare based the three spinners, the or based the three witches on the three fates in ancient Greek lore. So I, I thought, wow. What about, what is the question there? Why, what scared them out of Greece in order to go to Scotland? And mm -hmm. I thought something must have really terrified them to have to do that. So that was the question I asked and that's what I wanted to explore. And that's how the genres kind of cross over in this. So it's it's fantasy in that they're, they're witches, but they've also got this backstory where they're the three fates in Greek myth. And I wanted to explore that so that mm -hmm. they all kind of crossed over in that way and everything became part of each other. So, Fantastic. Well, <laughs> I didn't want it to be clear cut. Just uh, I don't want to keep you on. I'll never let you off here because when I get into topics, so <laughs> I'll kind of try and release you so you can like, oh, uh, <laughs> get a breath break from me. But um, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, great chat. Um, thank as you. Always, thank you. It's wonderful to cover all sorts of topics. Like I say, that's that's what this is all about. Uh, get people a chance to know you. Thank you. It's and, been nice talking to you. And yourself. And, of course, folks, if you want to keep up to date with Justine, um, links in the description to check out her work. We're going to be featuring excerpt from exit, uh, Macbeth Spinners uh, in the next couple of weeks. Obviously, every week we're doing new stories, so we'll get that finished and queued up, ready to go. Uh, Subscribe to the channel, keep up to date. Plenty more of this coming. We're always busy. And until next time, folks, keep it creepy, keep it horrific.